Welcome to the Pressure Injury Mapping Conference Call. My name is Vanessa, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, but later we will have time for your questions. At this time, I will turn the call over to your host, Diane Dome. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I am one of the Nursing Home Project Specialists here at Lake Superior Quinn and have the privilege of introducing our two speakers today. Samantha Hopp, under a BSN, who has over 15 years of experience focused in long-term care and higher education. Samantha wants us to know she has a passion for skilled geriatric nursing. She prides herself in engaging healthcare professionals and has demonstrated ability to institute positive change resulting in quality client care. Most recently, she has spearheaded an innovative pressure mapping project at Dove Healthcare. With Amanda's leadership, this project has provided residents with added comfort, decreased pressure injury risk, and improved quality of life. An added benefit is also the education Samantha has been providing to the staff in pressure injury prevention using this new technology. Our second speaker is Joey Pettit. Joey has 45 years of experience in long-term care and acute care settings, including both staff and management positions in long-term care. For the past 35 years, she has worked in long-term care management as a director of nursing and as a consultant with responsibility for staff management, education, and resident clinical care. Joey has extensive experience in developing and implementing quality assurance programs and wound care programs. Joy herself is both wound care certified and a diabetic certified nurse. She is a state and national speaker on a number of long-term care topics, including leadership, culture change, pressure injury prevention and treatment, and fall prevention. Her training and instruction has been instrumental in working with not only her facility, but with other long-term care organizations to produce culture change to improve the quality of life for the elder and disabled population. Joey has implemented innovative nutritional programs within her facility to assure resident choice and satisfaction that directly affect the healing and prevention of pressure ulcers. Joey is also the executive director of the Wisconsin Director of Nursing Council. This position requires active participation in multiple state coalitions. Joey chairs the state's hand hygiene initiative. This position also allows Joey to mentor other directors of nursing and to provide instruction through the long-term care nursing leadership program. And now I would like to turn it over to Samantha and Joey. Thanks, Diane. Um, thanks for uh, joining us for this webinar. We'll, Samantha and I are really excited about sharing um, our newfound uh, data related to the use of pressure mapping. And uh, in, all, in years of being a uh, wound nurse, I've never seen any technology that has really given me some extra power in assuring that our residents are comfortable and on the right uh, surfaces. So um, we're going to go ahead and – oops, um, we're in the wrong direction here. Uh, so I just want to talk briefly about how we uh, got involved in the use of pressure mapping technology. So about nine years ago uh, at Dell Healthcare, I – uh, had a resident who we thought we were doing everything correct for. The resident uh, lost some weight and um, was more restless and had a red spot on their bottom. So we assumed that uh, she was uh, experiencing some pressure and uh, put her, uh, we wanted to make sure we had her on a good cushion and in the right seating. So we had just purchased a uh, a high-end uh, pressure redistribution chair, and so we put her in that chair thinking we were upgrading um, the pressure uh, prevention, and when we did that, uh, the next day, less than 48 hours, she developed a pressure injury. 
and this pressure injury uh, actually evolved to a stage three. And I was, really our staff was just kind of beside ourselves because we thought we had done all of the right things. We put her in a high end chair and we felt really comfortable with that decision. However, in hindsight, uh, obviously it was a, a wrong decision. That was how I got introduced to pressure mapping. I happened to call, I've been working with a uh, cushion um, distributor, and I called um, the representative and I said, you know, we're really disturbed here. We've got a resident who's developed a pressure injury in-house. It's a serious injury. We thought we were doing the right thing. Can you help us decide on the appropriate cushion for the baby? And uh, she said, you know what? I'm in town. I'm coming through your town. I'm going to stop in. I have a pressure mapping um, device in my car, and I'll bring it in, and we'll uh, we'll see what it looks like when we assess this individual on the pressure mapping check this uh, device. And so I said, well, I wasn't familiar with it. I had seen pressure mapping as part of research, but I really wasn't familiar with it. And so I came in. We found out that the chair that we had put her in really was portable, and um, we had done this advantage, and it was kind of a high over And I said, I have to ask one of these things. And so that became a nine-year journey. Um, they, at the time we were looking at this, it was $15,000, which, as you can imagine, in the nine years ago, was a pretty hefty price. It wasn't in my capital budget, and therefore I was a little bit stuck. But I felt really passionate about this. So we had an intern, an administrative intern, and they needed a project. So I said, write a grant for this through uh, civil money money penalties uh, grants that are available through CMS. And so we did that, and we were denied. And so um, that uh, set us back a bit because CMS doesn't necessarily just pay for technology. They want uh, to pay for programs and things like that. So we said, okay, so we resubmitted about four years later, and we were denied. And then in 2016, 2017, we actually uh, submitted it one more time, and we were granted um, the, um, uh, a grant to CMS, to get this technology. And uh, I didn't know how significant this was going to be, but as we uh, have evolved over these last couple of years using the product, I think you'll see by our presentation that this is a pretty amazing technology. Um, so our objectives today, uh, we want to understand present practice around pressure redistribution. We want to explore pressure mapping and technology with you and its uh, potential for practice improvement. And then really we want you to go away with two to three practice changes that you can implement in your present ulcer prevention program, even if you cannot afford pressure mapping technology. Um, so the, what you have in front of you now is I'm going to try to introduce you just a little bit to what it is I'm talking about when I talk about pressure mapping technology. So what you see on the slide is a wheelchair mat and a tablet. So the wheelchair mat sits in the, in the wheelchair seat and it's connected to a tablet. It has some software and it actually, and I'll show you some mapping here, it actually uh, maps the pressure by using sensors within that map. And then there's also a bed application that works exactly the same way. It has sensors throughout the mat, or throughout the uh, mattress uh, cover, and it sends those, uh, that data to the tablet to produce mappings or tracings that look like this. So as you're looking at the screen, on the left-hand side, you'll see that um, there are red and green areas, and on the, the immediate uh, uh, left of that, there's the colored gradation, and that's showing the millimeters of mercury of pressure at those points. And so you can see in the individual on the left, that we've got a lot of red right over the initial tuberosity, and that pressure is showing up to 200 or more millimeters uh, of mercury. 
on the right hand side, that's where we want everyone to be when they're sitting. We want them to be in the blue, which means that there's a little uh, pressure at, uh, over uh, the entire uh, surface that we're mapping. And so that's what we're going to be showing you today. I just need you to, you to have somewhat of a, uh, an idea of what we're talking about when we say pressure mapping technology. And uh, Samantha is going to uh, take over in a few slides here, and she is our uh, pressure mapping guru at Duff uh, Healthcare and uh, can explain a little bit more about these tracings and what kind of data that has given her to make uh, um, surface decisions. So as we all know, and just going to go through a little background, as we all know a pressure injury is injury to areas of the skin and underlying tissues that are typically over the bony provinces. Um, there's a cost to the quality of life. So even though we know that many pressure injuries are preventable, we know that some are not, uh, over 2.5 million people still develop pressure injuries annually. Pressure injuries, of course, as you, as clinicians will know, are related to sepsis, significant pain, mortality, and mostly a decreased quality of life. Then there's the financial cost. So treating pressure injuries once they have developed costs approximately $11 million billion annually. And so we know if we can prevent any pressure injuries, we not only uh, improve quality of life, but also the cost of care. Um, so let's take a brief moment to look at what do we do now when we look at pressure injury risk assessment. We know that we have some tools, and many of us will use the Norton or the Braden. We look, look at those to, to help us, uh, along with our clinical judgment, to make decisions on how we're going to prevent pressure injuries in a particular resident. We know that all of those risk factors are not equal for uh, patients in all things, and we also know that it doesn't consider all the factors. So there are some limitations. And then the other thing we do is we use pressure redistribution services. Those are our cushions and our mattresses that uh, provide some pressure redistribution, um, and we can uh, purchase foam or air or water. There's uh, a large variety of uh, redistribution services, but we lack a national performance and reporting standard. So there's no real objective way to know that if I purchase this cushion that is good for an individual that weighs anywhere from 150 to 350 pounds, what it, it is going to do for that particular individual that I'm looking at today. And so there is no real objective way to do that with, uh, with what we have um, at uh, the toolkits that we, we normally use in, in uh, long-term care. You can't talk about uh, pressure injuries without understanding just a, a little bit about tissue tolerance. So first of all, understanding the definition, it refers to the ability of the skin and underlying tissue to tolerate pressure, uh, exposure to pressure without adverse effects. But the, the important thing to remember is tissue tolerance is individual. It's affected by many things. And uh, so therefore, again, being able to measure somebody's tissue tolerance is a very difficult thing and sometimes subjective. So it's... Pressure injury uh, development is complicated. Uh, pressure mapping technology addresses one issue, and that is the pressure at the interface of the skin and, and the, the support surface. Um, but we know that other factors affect the ability of our tissue to stand up against pressure, and those are nutrition, our body frame and composition, incontinence, and other comorbidities. And I'm going to show you... Um, this slide and this article written uh, uh, in the uh, Journal of Advanced Nursing is really a great article if you get a chance to read it because it really um, talks very uniquely, I think, about the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that, uh, that affect an individual's ability uh, for their tissue to tolerate uh, pressure. 
But we're going to look at pressure mapping, which can take one, uh, one piece out of the puzzle. But I show you this just so you understand that um, the, the development of, and the per prevention of pressure injury or, and or the development of a pressure injury is very complicated. So when we talk about what do we do now to see if we, when we put someone on a cushion that they uh, truly are getting the effect that we want, and that is for them to not be bottoming out to whatever the, the uh, surface is underneath this, this cushion or mattress. So what is in our toolkit right now is something called a hand check method. And whenever I talk about this uh, and when I perform this myself, um, it's, it's very subjective. There, uh, and there's no real evidence uh, to show that when I perform this hand check method, that indeed that resident is getting uh, the effects we think they are. So as you can imagine, when you and many of you probably have performed this, especially on the air-filled uh, cushion that's in the picture, where you supposedly are going to slide your hand between the resident's, uh, you, there's two ways to do that, between the cushion and the wheelchair or uh, right underneath the resident to see if they are floating on the cushion. Now, when you're talking about somebody who's 300 pounds and you're going to slide your hand under someone's behind or under the, the cushion, that is pretty, number one, pretty difficult to do. And you'll always notice that the resident's going to try to help you a little bit, so they kind of move, and uh, so it's a very ineffective method. Although it is one of the methods or uh, one of the methods that we do use. And this is, this is the recommended check for some cushions. So what has pressure technology done for us at Doug Healthcare? With our, uh, with the technology that we have available now, it has provided with truly objective data on pressure in real time. And so what we've found is that when we use a pressure mapping system and put all of our other uh, other tools in place as well. So we can't forget nutrition and all of those other items that affect tissue tolerance and the resident's ability uh, to fight uh, the development of a pressure injury. We now know, though, that we have a way to measure that what we have them sitting on is actually being effective. And so it takes the guesswork out of that positioning piece doesn't solve all the problems, but it certainly has made a difference in how we've been able to um, help our residents. Now, I've put this slide up. I'm going to talk about some internal uh, cushion terminology that we may that we're going to use through the presentation. But uh, so we, over time now, have um, kind of put our the cushions that we purchased in certain levels so that we can talk about them, um, but there by no means is a standard out there that you can go, oh, this is a standard cushion, this is a mid-level, this is a high level. There's a language that we've used and we put some of our cushions, and normally a standard cushion is going to cost us a little less, and a high-level cushion is those high, uh, those expensive air-filled ones or um, some of the other uh, high-end cushions that have adjustable um, chambers and those kinds of things. So uh, I just wanted to make sure you understood that there is no um, standards or no uh, terminology like this in the industry. As a matter of fact, that's one of the problems is that we don't have this kind of language uh, that's been um, standardized for, for support services. So uh, I just wanted to say that before we move forward. And now I'm going to turn the, the presentation over to Samantha, who has really been finding some just some very exciting uh, information that we're going to share with you today. Thanks, Joyce. Um, I am very excited to share this with you guys. Pressure mapping technology has made a significant impact at health healthcare. Over the past eight months, we've had the pleasure of mapping or working with 67 different residents and completing over 150 sessions. 
Um, a session includes basically a seating surface. So as Joey said, that mat goes on top of the seating surface on like a wheelchair seat, a recliner seat, a cushion, and then the resident would seat, sit on top of that or a bed surface or mattress. Um, so it's completely over 150 of those. Any of those individuals who have been uh, utilized pressure mapping with, they have, the ones that have had injuries prior to mapping have experienced improvement or have healed. We've um, been able to reduce pressure injury incidents by 50%, which I'll talk about a little bit more. This technology has allowed us to change our practice and also verify the decisions we're making. So looking at um, pressure mapping technology and improving um, our facility overall and the quality of life for our residents, um, here's a nice graph just to show the percentage of residents in the facility with a new onset pressure injury and how that compares year to year, um, average on a quarterly incident, incidence. And 2019 is the year that we've implemented this, um, this policy overall. So you can see that there is a 50% um, decrease in that new onset pressure injury. A uh, little case study for you guys is one of the residents we've worked with. Uh, we have a gentleman, 60 years old, a paraplegic, um, admitted with a non-healing pressure injury. We have an amazing wound care program here, um, and they've done a fabulous job. But even so, we couldn't quite get this wound to heal. He did enjoy very much being out of bed, um, whether that's for socializing or eating, but he was limited to 30 minutes at a time up out of bed due to that sacral wound. And that was just due to the fact that we didn't, we couldn't see the pressure, we couldn't identify what was making it worse. And so by potentially keeping him in bed off of that site, we were hoping to do the best by him. Um, the referral was made for pressure mapping due to his discomfort in his current wheelchair. He was experiencing fear and anxiety. If you can imagine at any facility being out of bed for only 30 minutes a day, doesn't allow you a lot of time to get transferred out of bed into the wheelchair, maybe get to the dining room, um, much less eat an entire meal and get back. He would start to get very anxious um, when it would get past that 30-minute time frame um, that potentially, you know, his wound would be getting worse or declining because of him being up. Our results when we were able to utilize this technology was a visualization of that pressure data. As I said, we have a great wheelchair program, but this wasn't able to be visualized. When we masked him, we were able to determine an appropriate cushion and then also get him fitted in a new chair with more repositioning opportunities. This allowed him to be up for a longer period of time, um, which really increased his quality of life, and I'm going to show you some of these images. So as Joey showed you guys previously, this is the reading we get on the tablet and this is for a wheelchair comparison. Um, his old chair is on the left, his new specialty wheelchair is on the right, with a him in the reclined position. With this technology, it, we found that it's really important to make sure that we match them in multiple positions, um, just to kind of see what things look like at different points of what they would be doing. Um, the image on the left, he is, he's reclined, but you can definitely see that there's some increased pressure there in comparison to the one on the right. And then this is, this is my favorite one because it's him in the upright position. And if you think about day to day, which you guys would do on a daily basis, if you would eat, you would be sitting upright. This really allowed us to have that data to say, hey, he can be up for a longer period of time. He can enjoy his meal. He can get up and socialize. And we're still going to um, make sure that that pressure is being redistributed. So um, there are some images of wounds. I'm just giving everybody a heads up here. Uh, at the point of PMC is on the farthest to the left, so when we first decided to um, pressure map him, we did his bed and his wheelchair. After two and a half months, you can see that that wound has greatly improved, and after three and a half months, our wound care nurse was able to deem it as healed. Um, this in itself, I think, really says it all. Um, we were doing as much as we could for him, but we really couldn't see. There was no visualization for that pressure. And since we were able to see it, we were able to um, get rid of it or reduce it for him and help that wound to heal. So looking at everything we're doing with pressure mapping, I think the goal is really individualization. We have residents, you know, that we take care of every day and every single one is different. 
Um, this is one instance of that, uh, looking at airfield cushion inflation. Uh, if you can think of an airfield cushion, there is a manufacturer's um, kind of recommendations to how to fill that, and that's supposed to be for everybody across the board. We're not all the same. We're individuals. And so why shouldn't that inflation, that air pressure within the cushion be individualized? This technology has really allowed us to do that. So the images you're seeing from left to right um, are real time. Images that were taken of an airfield cushion with a resident seated on top of that wheelchair mat. And you can see that as we adjust the pressure um, or the air pressure within the cushion, the actual pressure at the interface is changing. And in real time, we're able to show this to the resident and visualize that we were giving them the appropriate um, air inflation for that cushion for them. Another, um, I guess, thing that we found is use of non state materials. Um, it kind of found its way underneath cushions, on top of cushions. Um, if there was ever a slide from a wheelchair or a fall, it seemed to kind of be put in place. And we had a resident who had a moisture-related injury um, or ulcer, and we were kind of contemplating maybe there was a pressure component to it. And they had non-skin material on top of their cushion. When we mapped them, I left that non-skin material where it was. And you can see on the left mapping or tracing, there's a green area. And that's where that 4 by 4 piece of non-skin material was located. Just to identify if it was actually causing the pressure, if maybe there was something else, um, we listed the resident, moved the non-skin material, and then we mapped them, and sure enough, that area of pressure actually moved. And on the right-hand side, you can see that you located, which would be more under that toxic area where we had moved it. So to us, that, that was awesome feedback that we were able to say, hey, this really does cause an increase in pressure. It increases the effectiveness of these cushions, and we now no longer put any non-skin material on top of cushions, and we're really starting to get rid of it even being underneath as possible. This is another wound image of um, that resident, uh, you know, moisture-related, but there was a little bit of a pressure component. We were able to remove that non-skin material. We also mapped this individual's bed and changed their um, mattress, which we'll talk about a little bit. But at the point of pressure mapping, and then after two and a half months, once, a, once again, our wound care nurse was able to deem that as a healed area. So our discovery with this, non-skin material definitely decreases the effectiveness of support surfaces across the board. Um, we found that in the air-filled cushions, we found that in our standard cushions, and in all of the levels that we have here right now. Our intervention was to remove that non-skin material from the top of cushions and no longer place it to the surface of any cushion. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with these nice air-filled lattice cushions. Uh, we tend, when I first started here, we had a plethora of them. I um, didn't really know what to do with them. And, in fact, I remember walking through the back store room and telling somebody, well, what are we going to do with those? And I said, well, go stay there for a while, and maybe we can find something to do with them. Um, because of the pressure mapping technology, we were able to identify that these are great for use on recliners. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, many of our residents tend to come in with them if they're coming from the hospital. And it's a great way to um, just to utilize them, A, but B, not have to have our aides move cushions from their wheelchair to the recliner. They can have a whole separate cushion, but yet we wouldn't have to provide them with maybe two of our cushions on this one. For the manufacturer, um, there's a broad weight range of one to 300 pounds. There are pediatric sizes available for any lighter clients. And they are, for the manufacturer, um, good for prevention and treatment of pressure injuries up through stage four. So here's a couple just tracings of residents on these lattice cushions on their recliners. Just to show you like how these recliners map. I think a lot of us think of these nice big recliners and that, you know, residents would either face them and comfortable and that they can sleep in them. But we've found that they map very poorly, and I think a lot of that comes from the springs within, that they tend to mound more in the middle, and right in the middle is also where residents tend to be the most bony. 
So on the left, you see a tracing of a regular recliner seat. We can definitely see that very high area of pressure that's kind of popping up in red. And then on the right, you can see where it's actually been redistributed with the use of this airfield lattice cushion. This is a female at 109 pounds. Here's one at a female at 100 at 130 pounds. And once again, you see that recliner seat. It's not mapping very well. Um, and then the use of that air flow lattice cushion, we're seeing that that pressure is redistributed. And it's a very nice light blue, very low pressure. If you look on that color gradient, we're getting down towards maybe like, you know, the size area. And then here's a male at 200 pounds. So maybe a little bit more higher on that weight range for this cushion. Um, you can see how poorly the regular recliner seat maps. And these are different types of recliners. These aren't the same types of recliners. These are throughout our facility. But then with all of them, for the most part, it seems that these airflow lattice cushions are working pretty well in redistributing that pressure for them. So our discovery that does is that those cushions work better than we thought. Um, we are using them on recliners, or at least mapping resonance on them and seeing if they would be a good intervention. And it's also assuring compliance. Um, CNA is having to switch a cushion from point A to point B all the time isn't always feasible. Sometimes residents transfer very quickly and they don't get the opportunity to do that. Um, so by ensuring that there's already a cushion in that chair, it really makes it assures that, of, that compliance. We've used this technology as an excellent um, biofeedback tool for our residents and staff. Um, and this, this is a recliner, once again, and this is a resident who was sitting in the recliner with no cushion, was having a little bit of redness to his backside, uh, complaining of some discomfort. We decided to mask him, and he was very reluctant to put any um, pressure redistributing, redistributing surface underneath him. Uh, we Matched him, I was able to show him the reddened area and kind of explain to him what the risk was with that um, and that it was a high area of pressure that that could potentially break down. At that point, he was a little bit nervous and um, more willing to look into some interventions. We mapped on a standard level cushion on that recliner, and as you can see, that did not map well. Um, the thing that I think to take away from that is if we had somebody on a first or on a recliner and we put a standard cushion underneath them, we'd actually think we were doing better. And in this instance, it actually, if you look at the pressure reading on the bottom, it says peak pressure index, it was actually higher. Uh, we progressed to it, one of our high level cushions, um, an air film cushion, and we were able to redistribute that pressure greatly. He was comfortable. Um, he still was kind of a little bit skeptical about if this was really going to work or not, but once he could compare those readings, he was, he was all on board. Here's another instance of a biofeedback tool, and this is with that um, air over the mattress overlay for the bed. We have a standard mattress on the left, a low air loss in the middle, and on the right, a static air. Looking at these comparisons, the reason that it was important is we had a resident on the standard mattress, which you can see there is definitely some higher areas of pressure. There's that red-orange in the middle there, more towards their backside, and then the right heel. <laughs> and this resident was very comfortable in this mattress, did not want to move. Um, showed them the reason, and they were willing to try a low air loss. So we did use that for one night. They decided that they absolutely despised it and that they were uncomfortable in it. Um, with the explanation education of why it was important and what it did with pressure, they decided, well, maybe there's something in the middle, so we tried a static air mattress. Um, with that, obviously the reading was not as good as the low air loss mattress, but we were able to provide this resident with this feedback and show them the comparison, and they were able to make an educated decision. Um, they did decide on the static air, but they were educated on the fact that there was a little bit more pressure in it and that maybe it wasn't the best for them, but they were able to make that decision on their own. Um, some more interventions. This was a residence intervention. It was independent offloading. He wanted to be out more in the electric wheelchair. Um, his wound was significant, and um, we all had concerns about it. He decided that he wanted to offload, have an increased frequency of offloading. So we decided, well, let's map and see what it looks like. This is what it looks like. His intervention worked. So now you'll see him cruising around the facility, and every 
about every hour, he'll recline, he'll completely offload for about 15 minutes, take a little nap, and be on his way. This was that wound. So we, uh, that was one of the interventions. We also did map his mattress and adjust the pressure a little bit there. But at the point of pressure mapping is on the left, and three months later you can see that that wound has significantly improved. Our discoveries, um, this is definitely a visual aid for resident education. It helps us to involve the resident in their own decision making and educate them on our reasons for change and intervention. It's much easier to um, gain their trust and to encourage their compliance when they're able to see the reason of why we're doing these things. This was one of our early discoveries, um, and it has to do with an incontinent product. We had a gentleman that had had some significant weight loss, um, and he did not have any any other injuries or any redness, any skin breakdown. But we wanted to reevaluate his cushion and make sure that it was still appropriate for him while mapping him. This is what the reading was, and I remember specifically grabbing the wound care nurse, bringing her up, and saying, "What am I missing?" And we're fidgeting around and trying to figure stuff out. And she looked, and come to find out, his grief was much too big for him, and it was all bunched up. So she straightened it out, we remapped him, and that pressure was redistributed. That's something we would not have been able to see, period, or know about um, until it was potentially too late. And this resident did not have any skin breakdown at that point, but it was just a great way, it was a good acknowledgement in the idea of being proactive and preventing. So um, our findings and appropriate sizing of undergarments can definitely cause pressure, making sure that we're resizing those undergarments and checking the, the brief size with any reported weight loss. So making sure we're on top of that, as well as that those undergarments are fitted properly. Resource allocation, many times I feel that residents get put on a higher end cushion or um, air filled cushion and we never take them off out of fear of if we take something away from them and maybe we put them on a more standard cushion, um, that we're going to end up with a threatened area or they're going to have some skin breakdown, so we kind of leave them where they are because it's safe. This tool has really allowed us that after, you know, maybe a resident's pressure injury is healed, they've gained some weight, they're very stable, we can map them and kind of bring them down to a more standard cushion that's still appropriate for them and not have that fear. We can go to bed at night and know that we're not going to have any worries when we get back in the morning. Our findings on changing the support services with peace of mind, updating the support services to match the resident's current situation and condition, and then identifying and utilizing appropriate cushions, resulting in cost savings for the facility. So here's another uh, air mask comparison, synthetic air mask to solar mask, and just showing that um, you know, a static ear, I think, with this individual reflecting back, we felt like it was it was effective. Um, without this tool, we would not have seen the the findings that we have right in front of us. On the left, you can almost kind of picture the person can see their arms, their back, um, that heightened red area in the middle of their back side, and then their left heel is definitely peaked. This really cued us that they need to go on a low air loss mattress as this person was not willing to be repositioned. This was another kind of biofeedback staff education that position is key. This was on a full air mattress. This resident had pressure injuries, um, was very prior to admission, but was very um, protective, very bony. And those three spots you see on the left side that are bright yellow and red were actually the sites of these pressure injuries. They would tend to, even though being repositioned, was scoot out. Um, and it was an educational tool for staff to bring them in and say, hey, even though they're on a full air mattress, you need to check them frequently and make sure that you're, you're repositioning them properly. Um, you're not just kind of rolling them on their side, but you're making sure everything is supported. On the right, you can see that that individual is positioned on the side, and they're barely even making a tracing on that reading. Um, so once again, tool for staff education. Um, Definitely educating the staff around the importance of positioning and giving them that visual eye. They can see their efforts. Um, they can see that what they're doing is making a difference and then engaging them to participate in the pressure mapping technology. All right, so I'm going to pass this over to Joey and she's going to kind of summarize the things that we've gone through so far. 
I'm going to summarize this in about five, seven minutes so that we have some time for questions um, when we're done here. So um, just to uh, – the one main thing is we have been much more proactive in pressure injury prevention and healing than we have been in the past because of this uh, very objective data that's available to us. We found things that maybe we know as nurses um, and we've been told by manufacturers, but we've been able actually to see these things and to uh, understand that they do cause pressure or can contribute to pressure. So use, uh, leaving a lift sling under some way, using non skin material, that was a surprise. When we realized it was on all cushions, not just on the airflow cushion that the manufacturer is very clear about, but it was on every type of cushion we used, that non-skin material on top of the cushion really uh, caused um, um, an increase in pressure. Um, positioning and learning how to position better in continent product sizing, it made us more aware that when people uh, are losing weight, that that incontinent sizing is very important. That um, properly fitting wheelchairs, uh, full, full air cushion inflation and how to make that uh, work for that individual resonance. And then when you just have simply an ad inadequate cushion, but we can't see it because we think it's okay, but now we, can act we actually know because of the data we're able to collect. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we have removed all non-skid materials from the top of cushions. We don't need lift slings in place anymore. Uh, we can actually show resonance that, that causes issues. We are much more proactive in resizing incontinent products. We do a better job of upgrading mattresses um, and uh, looking at proper inflation of both mattresses and cushions. Uh, utilizing wheelchair footrests that offload um, an individual's uh, under their, their thighs or also uh, better proper positioning. And then we've developed this classification of cushions that we can use internally so that we can share, uh, you know, between team members uh, the type of cushions that residents need to be on because of the mapping we've done. So what are the benefits that we've found? Well, we certainly improved the resident's quality of life. In that first example of the gentleman who can now sit up in the chair a little bit longer because we know we can see and, and know exactly what we're, uh, what we're dealing with. Comfort. So we know that when, especially for those residents who aren't able to speak for themselves, when we find somebody who's restless in a chair, one of the first things we do now is pressure map them to see um, is pressure part of the discomfort. And then we've seen uh, wound healing rates uh, or, or the time that in wound healing uh, decrease. We've prevented pressure points. Uh, we are better at the proper selection of support surfaces. We're using it for that resident biofeedback to um, make sure that they are able to make educated decisions on their care and then as an educational tool for our staff. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, the barriers to the implementation. When we got the product originally, we thought it would come with a little manual that would tell us, well, this is how you should, uh, this is how you should use this uh, technology. But it came with nothing. It, uh, we did an hour, um, the, the story is we, we got the product and we didn't have Samantha in our in our facility. So we got the product, we thought it was going to be easy and it would come with a manual. It didn't come with a manual, it came with a one hour um, YouTube presentation that was very inadequate. And it got put in a box for about a month or two months until Samantha is giving me three months as how long it was in a box. And we hired Samantha to start helping us understand how to use this, and since that time, it's been just a dramatic, every day there's a new discovery of what they use this technology. So now we've begun um, to uh, really understand the impact of this in, in our facility and to long-term care in general. Um, but we have been limited by the fact that there is no research in long-term care. And if anybody that's listening to us today knows of any research, 
with the use of this technology. Please share that with us. We've uh, had a college students research this for us, we've, uh, and we've come up with nothing. Uh, we didn't have the staff resources to develop a program. And right now, Samantha does this while she's doing a restorative program as well. There are no policies and procedures, so um, there's nothing, there's no way to start. And then just the financial resources to develop staff education and that program and then to provide that education. Um, there's also uh, the medical legal considerations um, that we, we have not delved into at all, but um, uh, we understand from listening to some hospital experiences that when you mask someone long term, uh, where you're recording it, that that then can become um, possibly an issue where um, the family or, or the lawyer can point to a period of time when pressures were greater than we, had, we would hope for. So there, there's not a lot of uh, data out there about that either. So our goal are to continue to develop our program so that it can be ready for implementation, to develop a toolkit that we can hopefully pass on to other long-term care facilities that would include, policy, would include policies, procedures, some educational templates, you know, how do we even document this stuff? Um, we, uh, we are in the process of designating a, a pressure mapping educator, and then we're doing outreach like uh, we are today to try to get long-term care facilities to understand that this might be a good investment for you and um, to maybe help and be a resource. Uh, for those facilities who may want to get started using this technology. Um, uh, we've got some references here for you, and then we'll stop, and, and uh, if there's questions, we'd love to, to answer those. I mean, one question that usually comes up in the presentation is, how much does this cost now? Um, as I said, when we originally started the proposal, it was about $15,000 for the the one um, uh, one uh, wheelchair mat and the uh, the mattress mat and then two uh, tablets to go with that. And the reason each uses a tablet is because you have the ability to allow someone to sit on it for a period of time. And that's one of the the um, uh, things we've not studied uh, in, in depth is how long can our residents sit and um, any pressure, the, the, with pressure reduced condition that's adequate. And we've not, so we've not done a lot on duration of pressure. And that's one of the areas that we still look at. So we need to look at. But right now, if you were to purchase this particular brand, it would cost about 4000 between four and $5,000 for the same piece of equipment. So if you remember the bladder scanner, when it first became um, uh, available to nursing homes, we were paying about $15,000, and now that, that price has come down. So we're hoping that the technology may still decrease in price over time. Are there any questions? Well, then, Leslie, if you can instruct our listeners on how to call in with a question. Yes, of course. If you'd like to enter your question in over the phone, all you have to do is press star, then one. If you'd like to remove yourself from the phone queue, you can press the pound sign or the hash key. If you're using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. So once again, to queue up with your question, please press star, then one. And I'm standing by for phone questions. So while we're waiting for questions, I do have one for you ladies. So we talked about documentation. Is there actually a print out from the, um, lap, you know, from your uh, idea that you're able to put in the chart, or how have you built this into your documentation? There is. So the, um, the, from the tab with the image you get, it says it'll download, you can download it into your computer, and then it'll save as a PDF. And so that's what we've been putting in as far as our reading when we do these sessions. And you had mentioned something about there's not a lot of information on, on legal considerations. I would assume that anything that you have documented hard copy would help with those questions as well. Correct. Um, uh, this is Joey. When, when we 
we talked to uh, someone in the in a hospital setting, and they were they were uh, sharing with us that they had hoped to put pressure mapping devices on all of their new beds, and that they would actually then record uh, over time um, exactly how well they were doing with pressure redistribution. And um, their legal department went, whoa, that will not be good from a legal standpoint. You know, and of course, like I said at the beginning, pressure is one component of, you know, uh, tissue, uh, tissue tolerance. And so, I mean, there's so many factors uh, besides just the, the point of pressure. But we know that, um, you know, uh, that that's the, the main cause, therefore, the, the uh, tidal pressure injury. But um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot unknown about that. We have not recorded anything at this point. We take snapshots of the tracing and put that into the record. Okay. Thank you. And is there an average time that you would map a resident for, or is that unique to their situation as well? This is Sam. I think that um, it's unique to their situation, but that's also something that we're working on um, right now as far as trying to figure out, you know, what is that best time um, as far as either duration or, um, you know, assessment-wise, who's the best candidate for this. And so that's still stuff that we're, we're working on, and I think, um, at least in our facility, whenever we map somebody, you know, we get a little bit closer to kind of solidifying all those details. I, th I think what might be helping us is as we see our pressure injury rate declining and our wound healing improving, we're finding that at this point, the, the key there has been just getting them on the right cushion to start with. And I think we will learn, Diane, over time, um, when we're able to do more study on duration, that maybe the cushion is good for, you know, the hour repositioning or maybe good for the two-hour repositioning that we are. But it's all going to be individualized, so we'll be able to do that. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. I don't see any questions in chat, but uh, Vanessa, would you want to be mindful of how they can call in with a question? Yes, of course. If you'd like to ask a phone question, please press star then 1 to enter the queue. And I don't see any phone questions at this time. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience today, either Joey or Samantha? I, Diane, I, I thank you for allowing us to share this information. I think, uh, you know, the more uh, data we collect, we will continue our outreach and um and if anybody has any questions, feel free to connect with us uh, at, you know, uh, in some way because we're willing to share and uh, help any facility that would ask. So thank you. Thank you so much. We certainly appreciate you presenting today, and I don't see that we have any calls, so I think that we can wrap up this call. Thanks, everybody, for calling with us today. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes our conference. We thank you for participating.